Welcome back to another episode of Swamp Stories. But first, I would like to thank everyone for 50,000 subscribers. The supporters on this channel are amazing and you guys make it what it is, no doubt. And for those who are new to Swamp Stories, we are trying to cover the world one city at a time. So let us know in the comments why your city should be on Swamp Stories. Also, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. Let's get into the video. Welcome back to South Central Los Angeles, the most legendary part of the West Coast. For this video, we head to the west side of South Central, specifically West 55th Street. Between Normandy and Vermont, you have a small section that was originally called the 5-5 Hustlers. That started in the 1980s, which is about a decade or two after the rest of LA. That's because this neighborhood was pretty nice, and it still is. The palm trees and front lawns outside of the bungalow style homes, it's not that bad. While it was certainly not Beverly Hills or Calabasas, it was a decent area to raise your kids. Well, that all changed in the 1980s because that was the start of LA's worst era. In order to defend themselves from the madness around them, they created the 5-5 Hustlers, an alliance of everyone in the neighborhood to protect each other. But then things kept getting worse and worse. Like seriously, it's even hard to describe. In 1992, Los Angeles had 1,092 homicides. That is about three per day, and the vast majority of them occurred in South Central. Life in South Central was absolute mayhem, and colors began to rule the area. The 5-5 Hustlers joined together with the 5-7 and the 5-8. That's when they created the Rolling 50s Neighborhood Crips. They also became allies with the Rolling 60s as well. It's all one rolling family. You five me? Wait, wait, wait. Let me try that again. <clears throat> you five me? Anyways, ever since the 1990s, the rolling 50s have represented what it is to be a crip. <laughs> Y'all think crips got to do with money. <laughs> ain't got nothing to do with money. That's protecting your homeboys. Watching out for one another. If somebody came up to you tomorrow, grabbed you and said, I got a job, a good job, good pay for you. That make a difference. Come on, let's go now. They ain't gonna stop me from cripping. <laughs> but you take the job crib. too, would you? Huh? You take the job too? I'm a crip at work. Over the past 30 years, 5-5 has had four main rivals. In this video, we will get into some of the most important events that took place and introduce you to the new era of the 5-5 neighborhood. But before we get into it, let me run the intro. Five-five is not a very popular section in South Central. In fact, they have four rivals. Let me start with the Hoovers. Beginning back in the 1960s, the Hoovers are one of the first to form in LA. They're named after Hoover Street, which runs down the middle of their neighborhood. It begins five minutes down from USC campus and extends all the way down to 112. They cover a lot of ground, so much that they have multiple sets. Starting with the Five Deuce, the Five Nine, the Seven Four, Eight Tray, 107 and finally the 112. The 5 Deuce Hoovers are main rivals with 5-5 because they are just two minutes apart. So naturally that Hoover section is responsible for dealing with them. But as a rapper once said, take a picture with the ops and get froze with them. So it's really 5-5 versus the Hoovers. The unique thing about them is that they wear orange, but more specifically Houston Astros jerseys. So if you happen to be in South Central and you see guys wearing Astros jerseys, no, they are not baseball fans. You ran into the Hoovers. And if you're from out of town, don't come to LA wearing Astros gear. You might get pressed. Well, the Hoovers are famous for being held responsible for taking down Raymond Washington. Whether it's true or not, it's what the rumors say. The Hoovers' two most famous people are Freeway Rick Ross and the rapper Schoolboy Q. So now that you're familiar with the Hoovers, let's take you to another section. Let me introduce you to 5-1 Trouble formerly known as Nothing But Trouble. They are located directly above the 5-5 area. Across West 54th Street up to West 50th Street is all trouble, literally. One thing that's unique about them is that they wear Texas Rangers gear or anything with the T on it. So let's take you to the next rivals. Right below 55th Street, you have an area called Harvard Park. Then to the west, you have the Van Ness Brims. So when it comes down to it, 5-5 neighborhood is surrounded on three sides by rivals. They are boxed in. It's really 5-5 Crip versus everyone. 
Let's get into some of the events. Let me introduce you to a man named Marquise Caliz, also known as Tiny Crumb. He is a 5-1 trouble head honcho. One thing unique about him is that he sports a haircut that spells EKG. LAPD interpret that as a sign that he makes people flatline. Interestingly enough, he used to actually call himself a flatliner. Tiny Crumb is not somebody you want to run into, and you'll see why. December 27th, 2011. Tiny Crumb is driving down 55th Street and sees two men at the corner store. Andre Lockhart, also known as D-Rock, and Stephen Wade, who's known as Tiny Drawdown. Well, after he sees them, he spins around the block a couple of times and D-Rock gets suspicious. He tells Tiny to watch out for the car. Well, it turns out D-Rock had a good instinct because just a few minutes later, the car would pull up and BAM! Across the street sitting in her car would be D-Rock's sister Talitha. Sadly enough, she saw this all unfold. And before I go further, I just want to make this abundantly clear. I respect Talitha's decision and it was the right thing to do. I would have done the same thing. But then again, y'all probably already knew that. Anyways, Talitha would go to the scene when LAPD arrived. She would describe the man as 5'6", caramel skin, and wearing a green flannel shirt. Marquise Caliz, also known as Tiny Crumb, would then get arrested for it. He would plead not guilty and take it to trial. The prosecution needed witnesses, Talitha and her friend Irene, to come forward. Well, the rolling neighborhood would tell her not to show up. That way, Tiny Crumb would get out. They told her they wanted to deal with him. Well, Talitha wanted to do the right thing. There is no reason to have your friends take such a big risk when you can just get justice in the courtroom. So that's exactly what she would do. At the trial, Talitha and her friend Irene would testify against him. Well, it turns out they didn't really have to. That's because Stephen Wade, also known as Tiny Drawdown, would come forward as well. He would point out Marquise and say he was the one who did it. I saw it. After the Rolling 50s testified against him, he was pretty much done for. Marquise's defense would be that he doesn't own any green shirts and that he wasn't there when it happened. But none of that was really going to help him. Marquise Caliz is currently at Corcoran where he is set to be released July 17, 2035. July 4th, 2012, 10 p.m. A day of fireworks and celebration. Well, that's for most people, but not for 5-5. That's because two of their teenagers had different plans for the night. 16-year-old Jeremy Stevenson and his friend would head down to the Van Ness area. They would approach a random house with a family sitting on the porch. They would get up close to the house and BAM! A man named Dashua Hunter had to have his jaw reconstructed and he was not happy about it. He would end up identifying Jeremy Stevenson. That was all it took. Jeremy is currently doing 40 years. July 4th activities became common in South Central. Just two years later, 5-5 would spend July 4th on the same hype. Except this time, it was the Hoovers who were on the other end. July 4th, 2014, Hoover's annual Hood Day, where they celebrate the community and have a big barbecue. Now let me explain that in LA, there is an unwritten rule. On Hood Day, you leave people alone. You let them have the day to celebrate. But 5-5 was not having that, and they don't play by the rules. Two of their members, Demetrius Doby and Jamon Carter, would get up at 6 a.m and they would go looking. They would drive around the Hoover area for two straight hours looking for people. Now, I don't know why they expected anyone to be up at 6 a.m. on July 4th. I don't know, what? Anyways, at 8 a.m., they would find a 33-year-old man named Maurice Marshall on 50th in Vermont. This was the first person they saw in the area, and he is much older than them, so realistically, they probably didn't even know who he was. Regardless, they turn around, and BAM! Jamon Carter would then drive up to Hollywood to hide out, but LAPD would find them. Jamon Carter and Demetrius Doby would get 50 years. Events like this became a daily occurrence in South Central LA, but things changed over the years, most importantly the demographics. In 1980, South Central was 85% African American. In the 2020 census, South Central is now only 20% African American and 74% Hispanic. Many people from South Central have moved out to areas like San Bernardino and Palmdale. For Bay Area viewers, that's like they're Stockton and Antioch. Once you move out to San Bernardino, you don't really come back. Anyways, let's take it to the current days of the 5-5 neighborhood. That takes me to the legendary C-Mac. 
the most loved and hated person in South Central LA. Let's dive into the biggest spokesperson and 5-5 representative. Known for programming and being all the way loked out, interestingly enough, C-Mac isn't even from 5-5 nor is he from the 50s. He actually grew up in Dorset Village, which is somewhat close, but he joined at 19 by choice, and supposedly he's represented it ever since. Well, Hoover rapper Jap5 questioned if C-Mac was real in a No Jumper interview. Okay. That's entertainment. Ain't no such thing as no beef. Cause you never met him, never seen him. I never seen I him, assume. I never heard of him before the internet. Like I said, I've been in the streets my whole life. I know, I know his big homie. Mm. Coldest part is Big C Mac. He used to be my barber. Really? When I was a kid, he used to cut my hair. And I know a few other dudes that I've been in jail with and dealt with. I know a bunch of people from over there. So it's like, never, I never heard of him or nothing. So how I'm finna beef with him? I'm not finna beef with you over no internet. I got too much street credit for that. Like, I don't know who you are. If Jap5 is being serious, then it begs a good question. If your ops don't know you, how can you be from the set? Could this mean that C-Mac is a crash dummy? Either way, he has a Hoover killer tattooed on his forehead, so he lets it be known that he doesn't like them. Jap5 would get on Instagram Live to talk about the legend himself. You fight me with the 5X t-shirt and the size 55 broken sacks, cuz. Then he would make a C Mac diss song. Well, anyways, C Mac wouldn't take it lightly. He would respond to him in an interview. Is there any way he would squash his beef with Hoover? I'm gonna go ahead and keep it 50 fifth straight. It will never happen. You find me? This tattoo is five ever. I can keep it 50 fifth straight. That was another question. Would you ever get the tattoo removed? Never. Then you hear a cut interview. Cut don't even sound like he sounded aggressive in that, that you find me the video. Old neighborhood crib cut cut. Sound cut sound like a Pee Wee Herman. Cut neighborhood crib. Oh, hi guys. Okay. Oh, oh, fuck yeah. Well, uh, you know, my, my, my pops is, uh, is that Jap, and I grew up over here, and oh yeah, uh, uh, this big homie C-Mac used to cut my hair. Then after this, C-Mac would purchase an orange bandana and check it out. Tiny hard head F.I.P. Tiny hard head F.I.P. Tiny hard head F.I.P. on hood. Tiny hard head F.I.P. Now I need people to answer these questions. Is this all internet stuff? Because to me, this makes LA look goofy. I can't even lie. Like how did LA go from NWA to this stuff? You know, Blueface, Crip Mac, all that? Well, I might have an answer. LA has simply gotten much better. Crime rates have fallen over the years and the area is much safer now. I think these guys are a sign of progress in a weird way. When you look at Southern California, San Bernardino is the only city that has high crime rates. And maybe they'll get a Swamp Stories, who knows. But with that being said, thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Swamp Stories. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe and let me know in the comments what you want to see next. Peace!